Welcome back to the channel. On this channel, I talk about medical studies. I get into the weeds, I read them deep, and I give you my critical commentary. Today, I'm going to talk about a study from Singapore. It's up on the screen. The effectiveness of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine against Omicron in children between the ages of 5 and 11. This is an important space. Of course, we know COVID-19 has a huge and very steep age gradient, and there ain't no doubt about it. For an unvaccinated, unimmune person who's older, getting the vaccine is incredibly life-saving, and I think that goes without question. Of course, the question is always people who are at much, much lower risk, especially kids between the ages of 5 and 11 who are at some of the lowest risks out there. Does the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine lower the risk of hospitalization, hospitalization that requires oxygen or intensive care unit visits or death? That's a very important question. And the reason, of course, is because one of the goals of vaccinating is to lower someone's individual risk of bad outcomes. Another goal of vaccinating is potentially for some diseases to stop population spread. But that's not a real goal that's feasible or tractable with the COVID-19 vaccines because we know that breakthrough is almost universal and inevitable for everyone who's vaccinated. The vaccine cannot halt transmission. So with that off the table, the real motivation to vaccinate children is to do so in their best interest. And this paper seeks to answer that question. Now, of course, there are other ways we could have answered that question. We could have run a randomized control trial at the time of emergency use authorization to show whether or not it lowers hospitalizations, ICU stays, or deaths. We didn't do that. This was developed through immunobridging, meaning we had randomized trials in the adult population, and then we just showed non-inferior mean geometric antibody titers as we move down in age. That leaves considerable uncertainty and ambiguity as to whether or not the vaccine lowers those severe outcomes we care about. It also is something that must be considered in the backdrop of a constantly changing enemy, a constantly changing virus. We have a new variant. So a lot of the original data that came from the original Pfizer vaccine trial that was, you know, in 2020. Now we are in 2022 when you have Omicron. So putting all, all this together, what kind of studies do we have? And the best we're going to get, I think, is observational studies. But just because uh, it's an observational study doesn't well, it doesn't mean it's very, very reliable. This study, I think, actually does have something to offer. So I'll walk you through my analysis of this. This is the effectiveness of BNT 162, 5 to 11. All right, the New England Journal paper. The first thing I want to point out is that vaccination is voluntary in Singapore and parental consent is required. So everything that follows here is predicated on the fact that this is a voluntary intervention. Now, there are lots of things we do in health that are voluntary. You might want to eat a handful of cashews each day or go out and sip a refreshing cup of coffee or espresso. You might want to drink a nice glass of red wine. You might want to eat blueberries or other uh, berry products. These are the things people do for health. And the reason I suggest I say some of these things is many of the things we do for health and in pursuit of health are linked to the types of people we are, our socioeconomic status, our friend circles, our culture, our, our tribes. And I think it's abundantly clear in the United States, and you see this from a wealth of population data, there is differences in vaccine uptake, particularly in kids, based on socioeconomic status, based on race, once again, I ran out of space on my memory card. What was I saying? I was saying that we know vaccination uptake, if it's voluntary, like all other sort of voluntary health behaviors, has strong links to socioeconomic status, to culture, to tribe. In the United States, we must admit, particularly for children, there are differences in vaccine uptake by race, by socioeconomic status, by levels of education, parental education. And those differences are also important for outcomes for COVID-19. Those differences are also confounding variables that may affect other patterns of health, patterns of comorbidity, and downstream outcomes for COVID-19. So the moment, and the reason I show this on the screen, that this is voluntary, the moment you see that, you have to think, well, confounding might be a real issue here. Now, what would be different? A natural experiment would be different. For instance, in Singapore, there are, I don't know, so many provinces or territories, and they didn't all have the vaccine uptake right Right at the same moment, they were staggered implementation because of a vaccine supply. So three counties randomly had it first, and then other counties or different municipalities. Then you can kind of do some more interesting analyses that will remove all the things that lead someone to seek vaccination for their kids, which are patterns of who we are. So this is something we'll return to. Children who had COVID-19 infection before the study start date and those who returned to Singapore after acquiring COVID-19 infection abroad were excluded from the study. Children who had already had COVID-19 are excluded from this study. 
Now, that means the children in this study are COVID, in, are COVID naive. They've never had and recovered from COVID-19. And that's a little bit different than the United States, where in the United States, according to the CDC's own estimate, 75% of kids have had and recovered from COVID-19 as of February. That number is probably a little bit below what it actually is because a few percentage of them are probably not detecting the anti-nucleocapsid antibodies. And also, since February, lots have happened. A lot more people have gotten breakthrough infections. So we might be nearing 90%, 95%, 97% as the United Kingdom has already reached long ago in terms of penetrance of COVID-19. Now, this study has nothing to do with us then. Having had and recovered from COVID-19 means that you are much less likely to get a second infection of COVID-19 and get very, very sick requiring hospitalization, ICU stay or death. These are the kids who are the most vulnerable. So whatever effect sizes you see in this study, they're gonna be smaller in our country that we've had and recovered from COVID-19. This study is the best possible outcomes you'll see. Whatever we're gonna see in this country is gonna be a diminuted, diminished effect size, smaller effect size. I think it's very important. It also means that this is not generalizable to us. It also is probably the reason why they're doing it in Singapore, that this is one of the few nations on earth that somehow kept the virus at bay from the kids before they could do the vaccines. So, you know, they're able to find this immune naive population. Certainly doesn't exist in the UK. Children were considered to be partially vaccinated starting on the day after they got the first dose and up to six days after they received the second dose. Now, this poses some methodologic issues, which is that you've gotten dose two in your arm, but we're still gonna keep you in the partially vaccinated cohort for six more days while we let that kick in. But you know, to some degree, it's not a faithful representation of what actually happens in life. What actually happens in life is, if I choose not to seek vaccination, what will happen to me? And if I choose to seek vaccination, what will happen to me? Knowing that between dose one and two, I might get sick. But the choosing to seek vaccination arm has to own that sickness. It's not like you can't say, well, you didn't give me time for the vaccine to kick in because the choosing not to get vaccinated arm has to own any sickness that occurs in that time window as well. You're choosing to do the quote unquote right thing to get your kids vaccinated and you have to own whatever happens from that choice. That's the question. And then the the trial is answering the question, which path should I choose? Which means anything that happens on that path you own. This is a common problem, I think, in randomized control trials where people want to disown things that happen on that path. You own everything that happens on that path. That's what we mean by intention to treat analysis. And, uh, you know, this is a way in which they're kind of obfuscating that a little bit. And it puts a little bit of a hiccup in, which I will show you later on in the study. How do they adjust for socioeconomic status? Housing type is a proxy for socioeconomic status. Are they in public housing with one, two, three, four, five, six, sorry, up to five rooms, private housing or other housing? And that's a that's their surrogate for socioeconomic status. They're acknowledging that there's probably differences in vaccine uptake by all those sort of cultural things that I talked about. Now, the problem with this is that a private house, private housing, you know, it means a range of things, you know. And, uh, and, and the public housing also, I, I don't know the intricacies of Singapore and what it means to go from one to two to three to four. I assume it's based on family size. There may be some other sorts of things buried in this that, um, you know, it's not intuitively clear to me that a five room public housing, it means that you are a higher socioeconomic citizen than a four room. Is it, is that true? Somebody who knows Singapore culture can put it in the comments, but this to me is a very poor surrogate for socioeconomic status. It's a very poor surrogate for socioeconomic status. You don't know how much money they have. You don't know their socioeconomic status. And you're not really adjusting for it. And that's, I think, a root problem in your, in your paper. This is their uh, consort diagram showing you the flow chart of people in this study. 269,000 Singaporean citizens and permanent residents of the age group were there. Um, you know, the vast majority had not been affected with COVID-19. The vast majority had not been affected abroad. They excluded people who got a two Pfizer doses before the study period began. It's a strange choice, uh, although those may be the most vigilant uh, parents out there. Um, They excluded people who got it elsewhere, et cetera, et cetera. They're left with, you know, 20% who are unvaccinated, 12% who are partially vaccinated, and 67% who are fully vaccinated. And they do everything in person days analysis so they can add those six days to the partially vaccinated cohort and take it off the plate of the fully vaccinated population, as I described. These are shown in person days. I think this is a poor way to show table one in person days. I think you should just show it based on the raw number of people in the arm and then later show the person days. But they're showing you person days here. And the only thing that jumped out at me is that the age at the start of the study period, the unvaccinated kids, um, were, you know, in the five-year-old age group, 30%, then 19%, 14%, 11%. And then the vaccinated, we're talking the reverse pattern, 5%, 11%, 14%, 14%, 18%, 18%, 18%, 18%. I guess I would say... To me, it would be logical that as you do vaccination, you will move from 11 to five, go downward. Why would that be logical? Because they have a slightly higher risk at 11 than five. 
But what this is telling you is that there's something very different about these cohorts. I mean, you can adjust for age, you can adjust for all sorts of things, but we have to acknowledge there is something very different about these cohorts. This is not the way it would appear in a randomized fashion, which is what an observational study ultimately is trying to emulate or simulate or capture, as Miguel Hernan and colleagues comment, a randomized study. And this doesn't quite do that, I don't think. Here's a big thing. In terms of endpoints, we're going to talk about hospitalization, but I want to point out the key thing. Among hospitalized children, five received supplemental oxygen, four of whom were admitted in the intensive care unit. Of these five children, one was unvaccinated, two were partially vaccinated, and two were fully vaccinated. They don't tell you how many went to the unit. No deaths attributable to COVID-19 were observed during the study period. Zero kids died of COVID-19. Zero kids, unvaccinated, vaccinated, not a single kid died of COVID-19. Thank goodness this virus does not exert its greatest toll on children. Five of these kids were getting oxygen. Okay, you know, it's fine to be hospitalized, but hospitalized is a little bit murky because you could be hospitalized with a broken arm and swab positive for COVID-19 on screening. Are you hospitalized with COVID-19? By this study, I think it would be yes, but are you really hospitalized with COVID-19? No, it was a bystander. It was, it, was, it was just there for the ride. But if you're hospitalized and getting oxygen, I think it's more, I'm willing to concede to you that those are likely due to the COVID-19 driving you the shortness of breath, leading you to get the oxygen, et cetera, the hypoxemia, et cetera, et cetera. But it's only five. I mean, it's so vanishingly rare. That's good news. That means, you know, I think at the conclusion, you know, these are all reasonable choices. Here's what else they say, and this is Singapore data, in the age group of 5 to 11, and also says this is a manuscript, the incident rates of adverse events and severe adverse events are similar, 0.14 and 0.005, um, which is, sorry, serious adverse event here, which typically requires hospitalization. And a point that Tracy Beth Hogue, the epidemiologist, makes is that in Singapore, you know, the risk of severe adverse event or serious adverse event following vax was, you know, 0.000. It's very, very rare, let's be honest, but it's comparable to the risk of needing to be admitted in the hospital requiring O2, which is very, very rare, you know. And so we're talking about very, very rare safety signal, very, very rare requirement for O2. I've plotted here. And this is just a, like, I didn't do anything to this plot. I mean, this is just the plot that will come out of Excel if you set the axis to 100%. What is the risk of being hospitalized, vaccinated, and here I use fully vaccinated, or unvaccinated for hospitalization, getting oxygen, or death? Of course, there are no deaths, so that's going to be zero. But you can't even see the other bars. Why? Because the risks are so low. This is, this is it. This is what you get. I mean, this is the graph. It's very, very reassuring. Let me blow it up. We zoom in. Poof, we're zooming in, we're zooming in. This is less than 1%. We're talking about one quarter of 1%. There's the difference in hospitalization between unvaccinated and fully vaccinated, according to this study. Getting O2, you might see a little flash of color on the screen. Death, you see nothing, there's nothing. Abysmally low rates, okay? And we don't know these hospitalizations are due to COVID or with COVID. And the vaccine, we do know, will lower the risk of any symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 by some modest amount, usually in the, uh, you know, 10 to 30 percentage point ballpark, um, you know, from, from, from FDA data. Um, so this may just be cleaning that up so that the hospitalization counts are looking a little bit lower. But I mean, these are very, very low risk. Getting oxygen, you know, you, you can barely see it. I want to point out, people say, well, that difference is still the effect of the vaccine. No, it isn't. It would be if it were a randomized study. It would absolutely be the effect of the vaccine if this were a randomized study, because that's the only thing you're doing different between the two arms. But this is not a randomized study. So that's the effect of vaccine plus confounding plus any other methodologic issues that I haven't fully processed or other people may process. This is not the pure effect of the vaccine. You don't know the pure effect of the vaccine. This is a mix of all these effects. Uh, I think very likely confounding is a huge driver of this effect. We don't know. We just don't know. In the supplementary appendix, they'll actually list the number of people who got hospitalized between days one and six after the second dose. It's 13 people. Um, I uh, took those cases and gave it back to the second dose, you know, the fully vaccinated group, because, you know, let's really start the clock with, you know, fully vaccinated. It's not even perfect. You know, you should own everything that happened along that journey. But let's just, for the sake of argument, add these to the pile. And what you find is when you add these to the pile, it's hard to appreciate, but the, the bars get a little bit closer together and you still suffer from the fact that this is the vaccine plus confounding effect. This is the result. And I wanna point out, this is in kids who never had COVID. They never had COVID. They never had COVID. This is not America where the vast majority of kids have had COVID and these effect sizes are likely to be diminished. 
it is incorrect, I think, to say that vaccinating these kids protects other people. I don't think we've had, ever had any evidence that that would be the case in any population. And we certainly don't have evidence here. And with the diminishing vaccine effectiveness over time, uh, that's very unlikely to be the case. And with the fact that there's a repeated exposure, you know, any if you roll a dice enough times, you're going to get a four, you know, and you can make it a, you can make it a 20 sided dice instead of a six sided dice, but you keep rolling it, you're going to get a four. And I think that's one of the challenges people see with the people don't fully appreciate with COVID-19 that we're in a repeated interaction action that's going to go on forever and very likely we're going to have 100 percent near 100 probably 93 to 97 percent breakthrough so i wrote my piece my piece is entitled kids vaccine is low risk either way i mean i showed you the serious adverse events there's a lot of zeros and then that five and i showed you the risk of requiring o2 when you're hospitalized it's a it's a low risk either way what does that mean to me from a policy standpoint that means this is not the place where you need fervent advocacy this is not the vaccine you want to 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 say it's just the same as all the other routine childhood immunizations you keep saying that and people will devalue the routine childhood immunizations that may come to bite you in the backside in the future and we already see that with dwindling routine vaccination rates you want to acknowledge that this is something that's different you want to acknowledge that the risks are super low either way and you want to let people just make whatever choice they want and no need to pressure you don't need to spill public health energy on this and if you do i think you are totally misguided you don't understand risk and you don't know how to read the paper and you don't know how to think about medicine and um and i see many people fall into that pitfall fall into that camp there you know i i said that if you if you're pushing very hard on this fervently uh vehemently uh you're off your rocker and you are because it's very likely that you're going to actually cause greater harm and loss of vaccine acceptance um rather than actually achieve any real victory if you want to push on something push on boosters and the old people that's a, a much more sensible thing to push on if you want to push on a sensible public health measure your breath should have value and here it's i think mostly misspent the risks are super low either way it's no big deal. I shouldn't judge anyone for doing it or not doing it. I mean, and we have 30% uptake in five to 11 year olds. We have about three or 5% uptake in less than five. I think most people are, are not doing it. That's okay. We don't need to push on it too hard. We certainly wouldn't want to be so crazy that we would mandate this for school admittance because what you're going to have happen is you're going to just bump out. You know, even if you push up your numbers by doing such a draconian thing, you're going to bump out. 10%, 20%, 30% of students, they're not going to be the average student. They're more likely to be minority student. They're more likely to be lower socioeconomic status. And you're going to crush their future over these very, very low risks, as I've shown you on the graph, um, and, and no benefit to third parties. It, it, would, it would be totally illogical, make no sense. But I see uh, the zealots are banging the drum. They're going in that direction. Um, it's important to learn how to read papers. It's important to read papers for the broad context. I see uh, uh, people uh, can focus on minutia, uh, focus on decimal points, but you need to be, have some broad understanding of how to read a paper, how to make sense of it in the existing body of literature. That's a skill that comes with time. It doesn't just come to uh, you know the average person who's just reading a few papers one off. It takes years uh, to have some framework for how you approach a paper uh, and how you approach a policy decision. And uh, I, I really worry that we're in a bad place. This is obviously a loaded, a loaded issue where people feel very strongly. Um, those emotions are one thing, but if you're a scientist, you have to take your emotions and set it aside. It's not an emotional issue. Uh, you, there are numbers. We've quantified the risks. There may be people who want to exaggerate the harms. I think that's wrong. People who want to exaggerate the benefits. I think that's wrong. It's a very neutral choice. This is based on observational data. If you had randomized data, I think you'd get even more granular and more accurate data. Um, I'm giving credence to the observational data. I, I, in fact, think the observational data here is inflated. And if you take people who've already had and recovered, I think the absolute risk will be and the absolute benefits will be much, much lower. Everything is going to be lower. And we need to acknowledge that in our policy discussions. Uh, I don't see that coming from the White House. I certainly don't see that uh, among a small cohort of uh, um, I think uh, activists on Twitter who are, are really not not uh, facile and, and not comfortable with data analysis. Uh, these are my thoughts. You know what to do if you like this video. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. This is how you should be thinking about the Singapore study. We'll be back to talk about more studies and more other fun issues in medicine next time. Until next time.